Welcome to the Northgate Church Podcast from the heart of Chester in the UK. Well, this morning's um, word is entitled Great Moves of God. And I'm just going to make a start this morning. And last week, or the last time I was speaking, you may remember that um, it was on Easter Sunday and we spoke on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we've had um, uh, the atonement, Jesus has died for um, our sins and then he's been raised to life again um, on Easter Sunday with resurrection power. But after that, between Resurrection Sunday, for the next 50 days, not too much seems to be happening in the kingdom of God. Having been resurrected, Jesus appears to his friends and his disciples and to many others for 40 days. And it says that he taught them about the kingdom of God. Um, And we get to, 40 days after the the resurrection, we get to Ascension Sunday. And it becomes very clear at that point that although Jesus has come back, the ministry, the commission that he's given to his disciples is not going to continue with him present. And he says to his disciples, now I'm ascending to my Father. I'm going to sit at the right hand of God. But you, my disciples, are to wait in Jerusalem until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, And so the disciples pray for 10 days, about 10 days, until the day of Pentecost. And on that day, the Spirit of of God is released upon the earth. Thousands are saved and the church explodes into power, into dynamism. It's going out from Jerusalem, Judea and to the end of the earth. But it didn't happen because of the apostles' great planning and strategy or organization. It happened because of a move of God's spirit in response to a hungry people. And likewise, we here, first and foremost as God's people, we are not looking for strategy or a great plan or even a great ringtone. Um, First and foremost, we are looking to encounter the Spirit of God, that he may work deeply and truly in each one of us. If I could say the commission that Jesus gave to the disciples, they were born again, they'd been walking with Jesus day and night for three years, but the atonement the resurrection and being a constant pal with Jesus for three years was insufficient in and of itself for them to fulfill the commission and the life that God had for each of them. It was insufficient. There was another piece of the puzzle. And Jesus said, Before you can live as I want you to live, before you can conquer the world and extend the kingdom and push back the powers of darkness and come into all that I have for you, you are to wait until you receive the Holy Spirit. They were never meant to do the job in their own strength. They were never meant to move outwards in the atonement and the resurrection and being born again. There was another element and it was the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And for us too, um, salvation and being born again is great. It's what gets you into the kingdom. It's what totally transforms you 
on the inside. It's what makes you a son and daughter of God. It's, it's life changing. But in order to be a man and a woman, a daughter or a son, in order to fulfill all that God has for you, we must engage with the Holy Spirit. Um, so, this morning, I want to speak on one element of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in and among us. Um, yeah. So, if we look at Genesis 1-2, I just want to look up these where the Spirit has moved powerfully. If you could look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, if you have a Bible. Um, and it says this, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this was the state of play. The earth was formless and it was empty. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So, if you could just maybe close your eyes and try and imagine this. There is darkness. Everything around is darkness. It's formless. It's void. And there are deep, deep places that are filled with darkness. But what is hovering over the darkness and the void? It is the Ruach, the Spirit of God, who hovers over this empty and dark place. And in that position, God speaks, and the Ruach of God is able to penetrate the darkness, penetrate the void, penetrate the empty place where there is nothing. And the Spirit of God is able to bring light and life and order and beauty out of the deep darkness. This is what the Ruach, the Spirit of God, this is part of his remit. And this morning, he is still doing the same thing. So I want to ask you and myself, I've been asking myself the same questions. Are there areas in our lives, are there parts of our life where there's darkness, where there's a void, where there's chaos, where there is no order, which I suppose is what chaos is. Is there a place that's not living, not thriving? Because I want you to know, well, I believe God wants you to know, that this morning the Ruach of God is hovering over you. And it is hovering over those places in your life that are deep and dark and void. You are not alone in that area of your life. You may feel overwhelmed. You may feel at a loss. You may feel, am I ever going to get out of this? But this morning, I am declaring to you that the Ruach of God is with you and he is powerful and he is able to minister in to that dark, deep place where you are struggling in darkness or chaos. The second example of where the Spirit of God moves, just that I'm going to use this morning, is Genesis 2, 5 to 7. And it says this. And no shrubs, so we're halfway, well, we were through the, uh, we're through the creation process. And it says, no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent the rain on the earth, 
and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. This is the key, the bit I want us to look at. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and he breathed the breath, the ruach of God into his nostrils, the breath of life. And the man became a living thing. Can you imagine that? But God has created, let's say you, and you are lying on the earth. You are fully formed, but you are not functioning. You are dead. And God, the Ruach of God, he commands to the breath to come into you. Can you imagine, as you open your eyes, what do you think is the first thing you'll see? You will see the face of your father who loves you, who cares for you, who wants to give you life through his Ruach spirit. This is the God who you and I belong to. A third example of where um, the Ruach of God moves powerfully is in Exodus Exodus 14. I'm just going to tell you the story. This is where um, the Israelites, as you will remember, have escaped from Egypt. And Jesus, not Jesus, the Holy Spirit is leading them into the land that he has promised them. He is leading them on the journey into the promised land. They've come out of Egypt, they've come out of slavery. There are many, many hundreds of thousands of them. And they are being pursued by their mortal enemies. The Egyptians are coming after them to kill them, to persecute them, to enslave them once again. And they're on the edge of the Red Sea. They're hemmed in by the sea on one part and they're hemmed in by their enemies on another part. And I would imagine they are fearful and they are scared. And then it says the breath of God, the wind of God made a way by blowing a strong east wind And it was so powerful that this breath, this wind, could open up hundreds of gallons of water and keep it in place for as long as was needed. This is what the Ruach of God can do. We're not talking about crossing a puddle. We are talking that the breath of God is so powerful, it can open up an ocean. And a million people can walk through on dry ground. The Spirit of God can make a way where there is no way at all. To the Israelites, they were lost. They were wailing, they were screaming, they were panicking. I'm trapped. I cannot get out. I will die. My children will die. But the Spirit of God can make a way because the Spirit of God is mighty and powerful. And this is the Spirit of God that God commands the 12 disciples and all the others. Pray. Wait, ask, engage, and ask for this spirit to come and live with you and to help you. Now, I want to say something else. If I was, if I was by the Red Sea, and I had my children or my grandchildren, Gerald, all of you as my friends, I would cry to God. But let me tell you, I would expect God to send a helicopter. 
I would expect God maybe to send an ocean liner complete with, you know, a nice swimming pool and a nice restaurant and nice bars, perhaps. I would maybe expect God to build a bridge if I was stretching my faith. I would not expect God to open up the sea before me. And the reason I say this to you is because of this. God decided that when he was going to make a way where there was no way, it didn't didn't feel awfully safe. Can you imagine stepping into the ocean bed and you've got walls of water either side of you? I'd be scared. Sorry. Will those walls hold? What, do you mean I've got to walk all that way when I've just walked all this way from Egypt? What if the walls cave in and I drown? What if it doesn't hold? Are you sure this is you, Lord, or is this just some weather phenomena? There are two things I want to say here. There are areas in some of our lives where we feel hemmed in, where we feel trapped, where we cannot see a way. And in the natural, there is no way. But the good news is God can make a way for you, even though there is no natural way. But... And I have learned this many times myself, even recently. The way he makes may not be the way you expect or the way that you want. And so if we are to be a people who are encountering the Spirit of God, our part is to learn to trust him. And our part is to learn to obey what he says, even though we might not be overly happy with it. Do you see? We have to allow the Ruach to work as he wants to. He's in charge, not me, although I do from time to time tell him, could he help me? And this is how I'd like him to do it. But we have to be a yielded people if we're going to be a people who live and move and breathe under the powerful breath of God. So for some of us, where do you need God to make a way for you this morning? Where are you hemmed in? Where is there no natural escape? Where does all seem lost? The next place, ooh, I've lost my place, where the Ruach of God moves powerfully, that he wanted to highlight this morning, was in Ezekiel 37. And I know you all know this. This is um, the prophet Ezekiel. And God takes hold of him. And it says this. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out um, by the spirit of the Lord. And set me in the middle of a valley. And this valley was full of dry bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know that wise answer. Then he said to me, 
Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make my ruach, my breath, enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, speak, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. So there's a few things just to draw out of that passage. When God takes Ezekiel to the valley of the dry bones, He is not taking him there to perform spiritual CPR, you know, where you pump the heart. Because the body has gone so far beyond that. In order for the dry bones to become dry, and I was going to go to my local butcher and see if I could get some bones, but anyway, I ran out of time. For the bones to become dry, they have to be exposed at least for 50 days before the sun. And in that time, everything, your whole body, will rot completely. So these bones, they weren't sick, and they hadn't just died. They were utterly, utterly dead, gone, decayed. Nothing of the body was left. But God said that I am able to bring these bones back together by my breath. My breath is so powerful that it can bring not only that which is dead, but that which has been dead for a long time. I can breathe in it and I can bring it back to life. These bones shall live. And not only will the bones live, but from these dead bones I will make a vast army. When the Ruach of God moves, he does want to restore us individually, but he also has purposes beyond us. He wants to raise up an army who can then in turn reach out to the many others, to a world that is dying and decayed and trapped and has no answers. So I would ask you this morning, are there places in your life or my life that you feel are dead? Are there places in your life that you think are so dead and have been dead for so many years that they are beyond redemption. They are beyond bringing back to life. Well, I felt God say something to me in my 20s, but here I am in my 50s, and I let go of that word, and it's dead, and it's too late, and it can never live again. I want to tell you this morning, There is nothing that is too dead in our lives that God cannot resurrect in the way that is right, that he sees is fit. I'd like to add perhaps a note of caution, which I have learnt from my own life here. 
where there have been dead places in my life, there are times when I have found, when I've had challenges, when things haven't gone as I've wanted or as I thought they should, and it's gone on for a long, long time, there are times when I have felt it's just easier to give up. It's easier to stop trying in that area because, do you know what? I'm worn out with even thinking about it. I'm worn out with thinking about my friend who hasn't been healed or my son or daughter who's rebelled against God or the promises that I once thought you, you gave me. I'm worn out with trying to make my marriage work. I'm worn out with trying to succeed at work. I'm worn out because some things haven't worked out the way they, I hoped. And in that time, for me, there have been times when I thought, do you know what, it's easier to sit down in the rubble of the bones and do something, watch TV, eat food, go shopping, go and see my friends. It's easier to give up but this morning, I believe God wants to say, the breath is available to you to bring back to life all the areas that you thought were dead, all the areas that you thought would never come to pass. The Ruach of God is able and willing. There is nothing that he cannot do in your life. There is no part of your life that he cannot resurrect and bring new life into. And I wanted to say, do you know that passage? Um, John 3. And it was wonderful because Joel was talking to me about this this morning. I couldn't believe it. We had a great conversation, didn't we, Joel? <coughs> It's that passage where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And he says to Nicodemus, well, you know, Nicodemus, you think you know what you're talking about, but actually you don't know anything. And the way to follow God is that you have to be born again. And Nicodemus is saying, well, how on earth can I get back into my mother's womb? He's totally off on the wrong track. And uh, Jesus says, what does Jesus say? He says, don't marvel at that, because I can do anything. And he says this to Nicodemus. He says, Nicodemus, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone born of the Spirit. Now when Joel came to speak to me this morning, he told me this wonderful story. Joel, it was Easter Sunday, wasn't it? Yeah. And Joel was sat in the children's class, or a children's class, or just looking out of the window. I don't really know where it was. And he said... He saw the wind move in the trees. And he felt what was happening was God was waving to him. And he knew God was there. And I thought, well, I think he should preach the sermon. <laughs> because this is what's true. And this is what I want to say to you this morning. What I believe God wants to say. Whatever you and I experience in life is only one reality. There is a far greater reality that we can neither see nor control. But when Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus and he says, you must be born again, Jesus is inviting Nicodemus to step into that reality and to become conversant with it and to respond to it 
and hear what the greater reality is saying. <clears throat> the other reality, although we can't see it and we most certainly can't control it, affects this physical reality. And what God invites each one of us to do is to reach into the reality of the spirit to govern the reality here on the earth. And that in reaching into the spirit, in hearing what the spirit is saying, this is why this course that Nick and Sue have been running is so good. It's talking about how we reach from this reality into the reality that we were invited into when we were born again. It's talking about how to engage with the Ruach of God, how to hear what he is saying. Because that reality is greater than this reality. Jesus himself lived like this. When he was in the desert, the devil said to him, didn't he? Oh, well, I know you're hungry. You've been here 40 days. You haven't had anything to eat. Make those stones bread. And that Jesus could have done that. At the, um, the wedding in Cana, Jesus told them when they ran out of wine, fill up the stone jars with water. It wasn't this reality that changed the water into wine. It was the unseen reality, the ruach, the power of Almighty God. You are not just called to be saved and to try and make it as best you can to the end of your life, living as best you can. You are called to that. But Jesus invites us to live as he did. Even Jesus himself, it says that when he was crucified, I think it's in Ephesians, someone will just have to perhaps look for the verse for me. In Ephesians, it says that it was the Spirit of God that raised him from the dead. Jesus himself lived as a man in constant relationship with the Ruach of God. Jesus was born by the Spirit, the Immaculate Conception, when Mary became pregnant, and after he died, he was raised to life by the Spirit. Now, this is what Jesus and the Father invite us into that our lives are not limited by what we see and hear and feel and touch, but they invite us into this whole new reality. So how did the disciples enter that reality? First of all, they obeyed Jesus' command not to go out and try and do things on their own strength. He said... Go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Spirit that my Father made. And that invitation is there for us. And the disciples engaged with it because they gave themselves to prayer. They did not know what they were asking for. They didn't know what it would look like, what he would look like when he came. They just gave themselves to asking, Spirit of God, please come. In that, they were totally yielded to the Spirit of God. They weren't like me, ordering a cruise ship at the Red Sea. They just said, Spirit of God, we don't really know what you're going to be like or how you're going to come. But Jesus has invited us to invite you to come into our lives. Please come. And then you know the rest because we live beyond that story. He came like the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And tongues of fire rested on each of their heads. And it was the Spirit who propelled them out of the building to share and proclaim the good news of Jesus 
And it was the spirit who convicted 3,000 people of their sin and they cried out, what must we do to be saved? It was the only part the disciples did was engage with the spirit of God. And that is what we're looking for here. That individually and corporately, we as a people become those people who don't have a great evangelism program, although we may have a program. We don't just read the word, although we do read the word. But we are a people who are beginning to learn to be baptized in the spirit and then to live and move in concert with the Spirit. I loved um, last week, or well, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, when we were in the Hearing God course, and Nick turned to Heather, and he just said, the Spirit is teaching you. Heather has done some amazing things. She is an amazing woman. And she's done some things in the world recently that have had tremendous impact, tremendous impact over a period of time in her place of work. Through Heather, the spirit has turned around a whole business and is continuing to do that. And Nick turned to her. I don't think he knows any of that. And he just said, uh, God is teaching you how to stay in step with the spirit. And because she is working in concert with the spirit, huge fruit is happening. Huge things, really significant things that have, for how many employees in this area? There, I don't know, 20, 30, but there's a whole organization above her. And Heather has the ear of the head honchos. And things are beginning to change. Justice has come in. Good standards have come in. Fairness and rightness has come in. It's benefited the children. It's benefiting the staff. And I believe it's going to go on further. But it didn't come with Heather having a good idea of how to reach the people in her nursery. It came with her engaging with the Spirit of God. And... God wants to move in all the dark and broken areas that each of us have got. We've all got them. And, well, if you haven't got them, then please come and tell me how you got there. We've all got them. And, but what we can do sometimes, well, speaking personally, um, sometimes rather than engaging with the Spirit of God... I can spend an awfully long time telling God why he can't engage with me. Well, Lord, I sinned. I did this wrong. And I was a failure there. And I wasn't very good in that area. And blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on and on. So I never come to engage with the Spirit of God because I've already decided... I'm not worthy for the Spirit of God to engage with me. you come and play. Now this morning, you know, maybe just close your eyes and just think, are there areas in my life that are deep and dark and where chaos reigns? Are there areas that are dead? Are there areas where I feel overwhelmed? or beyond hope because Jesus and the Holy Spirit want us to bring those areas to him 
And maybe we just need to repent and say, Lord, I'm so sorry that I've been trying to sort them out on my own or I've given up trying to sort them out and I have kept you at arm's length because I've considered myself not worthy. Um, So, Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will just come and that you will move among your people now. Holy Spirit, please would you come and show each individual where are the deep dark places that you want to touch Holy Spirit you are leaning over each person just as the father leant over Adam when he breathed the first breath into him and you are smiling father and you are pleased with each one of your children You are filled with love, with acceptance, with joy that each one here who belongs to you. And Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will help us to bring to you those areas in our life that are dark, that are dead, that are beyond hope, Lord God, Holy Spirit, please would you come. The word of the Lord to each and every one this morning is that God is a life-giving God. He came to destroy the works of the evil one in every single life. There is nothing you've done or said or think that deters him from his mission to set us free and to bring life to those places. And as the children come in, I just want to say, if there is anybody who has any area where they have had enough of living in darkness and bondage, where they're done with it and they want the freedom and the light of the Holy Spirit to come and breathe in them, then please come forward. Um, Come forward. And as we round up the service with a song, do not stay in your prisons any longer. Do you know what? When I first came to this church 40, 40 odd years ago, there was a word given about people were locked in caves and there were stones over the mouth of every cave and that God was wanting to call people out and to set them free from the caves that they were in. And I was a young girl, maybe... 22, something like that, 21. And I knew, I knew I was in a cave. And I knew I couldn't get out. And he asked people to come forward for prayer. And I wouldn't, because I was so scared of what other people would think of me. And I stayed in that cave for a long time. 
And this morning, I just want to say to you, please don't be like me. If God has touched anything in you, where you want freedom and life, then please come and receive prayer because God, the ruler of God, wants to set you free and bring life to you.